Hi everybody, okay, welcome back. We are looking today at Jeremy Duff, Elements of New Testament Greek. We're in chapter 8, which is entitled Other Patterns of Nouns and Verbs. And I have a feeling that I know what happened to your poor weary hearts when you turn the page, we're on page 91, and you looked at page 91, and then you flipped over the page, looked at page 92, and you realised, to your abject horror, that all the verbs that you'd learned before all the present and the future and the imperfect and the aorist in the indicative, and then all of the other moods, all of the different things you'd learned, you have literally got as much as that to learn all over again for a whole other pattern of verbs called the deponent verbs. When I was studying this, some uh, humorist in the class called them the despondent verbs, because that's certainly how we felt about it. Now, there is obviously some stuff to learn here, but I've got some good news for you. As ever, I'm going to show you that there are some patterns, there is some logic to what's going on here, and I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to make it a little bit easier for you. Now, in this video, uh, what I'm going to try and do first is I'm going to explain what the deponent verbs are, and then second, I'm just going to go through the patterns which I've got here on the board, which are summarised from pages 91 and 92, and try and draw attention to the some patterns within the conjugations which will help you to remember them. In the video after this, I'm going to go off-piste slightly and give you a, an alternative explanation to the one that Duff has here for what deponent verbs are. But at this stage, and firstly, I just want you to think about what a deponent verb is. The simplest way of thinking about a deponent verb is that it's just another kind of verb, which means exactly the same kind of thing as the verbs that you've already learned using the paradigm verb luo, but it just has different endings. Just think of it as a different kind of verb. That's how Duff explains it here. He says, um, deponent verbs behave just as other verbs do, including sharing the same pattern of epsilon and sigma. They just have different endings. Now, as I said, in the next video, I'm going to go a bit deeper than that and explain what the deponent verbs actually are. But for now, they're just another kind of active verb like luo and they've got different endings. Now onto these endings and onto some of the patterns which will help you to learn and remember them. Now as Duff has already pointed out the uh, deponent verbs in the indicative have the same pattern of sigma suffix and epsilon augment in the four tenses. So we use the paradigm verb ruamai. Well here's how it works. We've got Ru is the stem here in black. Here are the endings in blue. And then um, red and green, oops, forgot that. Red and green are the sigma suffix and the epsilon augment. And you see, just as with the, the verbs luo, verbs like luo, um, uh, future tenses have a sigma suffix. Imperfect tenses, uh, tense has an epsilon augment and aorist has both when it's in the indicative. So that's the first thing to be aware of. Now, still sticking with the indicative, more good news. You do have to learn a new set of endings for the present tense. Here we've got the indicative, present tense, ruamai, ruer, ruetai, ruometha, ruestha, ruontai. Ruamai, ruer, ruetai, ruometha, ruestha, ruontai. And as ever, you've just got to go away and chant that until you're blue in the face and have driven your cat and your sister and your parents mad with it. But when you come to the future tense, here is the next bit of great news. Just as with luo, so also with ruamai, you don't have to learn any new endings because they're exactly the same uh, with just the addition of the sigma suffix to signify the future tense. So you remember that luo, luace, lue, etc. goes to luso, luceis, luce when it goes from present to future. Or ruamai, rue, ruetai goes to rus omai, ruse, rusetai. Rusometha, Rusestha, Rusontai. So that's all simple. Once you've learned the present, you've learned the future, you get that thrown in free. Now, onto the imperfect. Again, you've got some other endings to learn here. Um, eru omen, eru u, eru eto, eru ometha, eru este, eru onto. Eru omen, eru u, eru eto, eru ometha, eru este, eru onto. Epsilon augment, stem, and then these are the endings. Nothing much we can do about that, guys. Just got to learn them, chant them, drive the cat crazy until your parents or your siblings or your wife or your husband is blue in the face. But then we've got some more good news. 
when we go from the imperfect to the aorist, familiar as ever, we add the sigma suffix, because the aorist has the epsilon augment and the sigma suffix, and then notice what happens, and I'll write this on here, I think. You know that aorist verbs, like the alpha sound, aorist alpha, and so the omen goes to amen, the eto goes to ato, the omitha goes to amitha, the este goes to aste, and the onto to anto. Anto, sorry, onto goes to anto. Don't go saying anto. O is a sound made by an omega. That's an omicron. So onto, anto. So you can see once you've got the imperfect, you've almost got the aorist. There's a little bit of a fiddle here in the second singular, u to o, but that's not too difficult to remember. But all the rest go from o to a, e to a, o to a, e to a, o to a. So that's something else. Once you've got the imperfect, you've almost got the aorist. Now, how could I forget? I nearly forgot this one. With the first and second person plural in the present and the future, you have exactly the same in the imperfect first and second person plural. So once you start to see these patterns, you can see that there, there isn't as much to learn in the indicative as you feared there might be. Just to recap, the present and the future are exactly the same. The pattern of sigma suffixes and epsilon augments are exactly the same as you've learned before. Yes, you've got new stuff in the present. Yes, you've got new stuff in the imperfect, but not that much new stuff because these are carried over. And then once you've got this, the imperfect, you can pretty much shunt that down into the aorist just with the tweaks to the alphas and you have to remember that the U in the second singular goes to O. All good so far. So that's some patterns in the indicative. Now, let's take a look at the other moods, the imperative here, the infinitive here, and the participle. Can we see any patterns here? Well, as ever, we've got, as you might expect rather, we've got the same uh, pattern of sigma suffixes. What I've done here is to lay these out, by the way, the imperfect, this is uh, present, singular and plural, aorist, singular and plural. Same here, this is singular, uh, sorry, aorist, <laughs> uh, what am I talking about? Um, present, aorist, yeah, present, um, singular, plural, uh, present infinitive, this isn't getting, this is a bit confusing now, isn't it? Um, <laughs> we'll carry on, um, aorist, singular and plural, and then just the aorist infinitive, and then the participles, present, aorist, and the top row is singular, and the second row is plural. Just to clarify, you get all those from the table anyway. I've just highlighted them like this to draw out some of the similarities, and just to highlight um, uh, uh, what the differences are. Uh, the similarities uh, to what you've already learned, obviously the aorist has a sigma suffix here, sigma suffix there. No epsilon augment, because the other moods don't have an epsilon augment. They only come in present and aorist, and therefore there's no need to have two uh, uh, extra signifiers to distinguish them from each other, just the one will do. Um, so ru, reste, rusai, rusaste for the imperatives. Again, notice, este goes to saste, uh, aste, sorry, um, in the ending, um, in the uh, second person plural imperative, and also You've just spotted this probably here and here. The second person plural indicative is the same ending as the second person plural imperative. Again, just the same as in Luo. So you're starting to see some of the patterns that you've already become aware of previously making sense here. Infinitives, ruestai, rusastai, again, Bit of bad news, you do just have to learn these, estai, sastai. Then finally, onto the participles. Um, uh, again, <laughs> explain it more simply this time. The top row is singular, the second row plural, the first column is present, the second column is aorist. I'm sorry if I confuse you with that later. Ruominos, ruominoi, rusaminos, rusaminoi. Notice again the shift from the o to the a sound with the aorist, o to the a. Oops, not there. O 
part of the a. Um, the addition of the sigma suffix to denote the aorist. And also you have some very familiar looking uh, endings. These are nominative singular and nominative plural. Well, these are the same endings that you get in logos. Now, just a brief note about the participle. We're going to learn the whole of the participle in about seven or eight chapters time. So don't worry too much about that now. But you do need to learn um, these ones. And what you'll see here is, well, you're learning the masculine nominative singular and plural participles at this stage. Well, these are the masculine nominative singular and singular and plural endings from nouns like logos. It turns out that with the rest of the paradigm for the participle, it follows the whole of that same ending pattern for nouns like logos. So again, there in seven or eight chapters time, when we come to that, you haven't got as much to learn as you might have feared. OK, so let's just draw stumps, just summarise what we've talked about here. At this stage, what I want you to think about is that a deponent verb is just another kind of verb, a bit like luo, with meanings that mirror verbs like luo, but it has different endings. And the endings we've been through, epsilon augments and sigma suffixes do the same thing as verbs like luo. Just a different kind of verb, um, but with different endings. Um, and then we've been through, and I've shown you some of the patterns here. Now, in the next video, what I'm going to do is actually tell you what deponent verbs are. You can skip over that video if you're not a grammar junkie, but the explanation in Duff, though helpful in summarising things, um, kind of leaves some questions unanswered. And I wanted to give um, you a chance to wrestle with some of those things in case it's interesting for you. So come back and join us in the next video and we'll go through that before we then uh, move on to the rest of chapter eight. All right, God bless. See you next time.